Good morning to each one. So good to see you. So good to be with you. Worship God together this morning. I invite you to take your Bibles out and be open to the book of Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 3. Later this week, many of our college age are going home, and we're thankful they're able to do that, but we're going to miss you while you're away, but we're thankful that you can have a break, and I know you're looking forward to a break from your classes, from the exams and all that, but uh, that area will, will be a void when you're away, and we look forward to your return, but um, let's be mindful of our young people as they finish up this semester, still with some classes and exams and their safety and, and going home. In Revelation, we have Christ addressing the seven churches of Asia, and the last and final church that he addresses is the church at Laodicea in verses 14 through 22. Let's read that together, please. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame, also overcame, and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, a local church course is made up of saints as we have here. It's made up of members. But if you have a local church that is lukewarm as the church at Laodicea is described, then implied in that is it's composed of lukewarm Christians. I'll speak to you for a little while this morning about the lukewarm Christian. Just this past week, a sister in Christ acknowledged to me that she had become lukewarm in her service to God. And this is not a sister of this local congregation that I speak of. But I I asked her when she acknowledged that, shared that with me, I said, "Why, why is that, do you think? What what caused this to happen? What brought about, what changed or happened in your, your walk with God that you got to this point? And so we talked about that for a while and prayed and studied. But, and I appreciate it, I told her I appreciate you being that honest and and recognizing that, realizing that, that's the thing about this church, that's one of the things, they didn't see that in themselves. Christ kind of had to hold that blunt mirror up in front of their faces. 
Well, how, how to know if you are a lukewarm Christian? Well, if you or I have become lukewarm, and it can happen to any of us, it happened to those in Laodicea, it happens today, as we just noted, then we lack zeal for the Lord. He brings that out and for spiritual things. And our heart is not really into it anymore, right? You're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, but, but you're lukewarm. And as I read that and think about that, this is one of the conclusions I would come to if I've reached the point or if you reached the point where we're just kind of lukewarm for Christ and the things of the Lord, then it probably indicates my heart is really at this point in time not really into it anymore. And we have a serious attitude heart problem. That's one of the things that came up with this sister in Christ in our conversation when she acknowledged that she had become lukewarm. Uh, and I was asking these questions to kind of think about that. Why is that? How did you reach this point? And one of the things that was brought up was attitude. The heart, right? And, and really, if we reach this point, we're at a crisis point in our faith. Weren't they at a crisis point in their faith? I mean, think about what Christ was going to do with them if this continued to be the case. And, and so if, if we're lukewarm and, we, and this is left unaddressed, unresolved, then it's going to bring about our, our spiritual destruction ultimately. And if we're, if we're lukewarm, then we may be going through the motions, right? Because our heart's not in it, just kind of going through the motions. Bodily, we're present, but not so much in, in our mind and our spirit. And so it makes it difficult to worship God in spirit and truth. If we're lukewarm, we're going to possess a lack of joy, a lack of enthusiasm, and as I think about how to know if you're a lukewarm Christian, more likely the lukewarm Christian is really seldom spend any of our t your time or our time reading the Word of God, right? I mean, do you really picture someone who's become lukewarm as devoting a lot of time to Bible study and to meditation upon the Scriptures day and night as Psalm 1 reads? And it's going to be one, a Christian who's lukewarm, devotes very little time to praying to God, communicating with the Heavenly Father. And think about when it comes to the songs. As Todd led us in some wonderful hymns of praise to God. We're not really probably going to sing those songs with any enthusiasm, maybe not really paying attention to the words and the main message of the song as we're supposed to teach and admonish one another through the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Our heart's not really in it because, well, we've become lukewarm. And we're going to neglect to speak to others about Jesus and the gospel because we lack zeal. We're not fervent in spirit serving the Lord, Romans 12, 11. No, we, we lack that. We've lost that. We think we're doing better than we are, but we're, we're, we're really not. And so it's not likely, is it, if you have lukewarm Christians, that they're the ones going out, inviting people to services. Hey, we got a radio program. It's every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., this is the stations and it's on. We have, we have services on Sunday, Bible class at 9, worship 10, worship at 5, uh, Bible study on Wednesday night, worship at 7. Love for you to come. Or handing them some material to read. Striking up those conversations. Lukewarm Christian's not going to do that. No. They don't have that enthusiasm. They don't have that zeal to do that. They don't have that focus to do that. Their heart's not into it. And the mind is more than likely centered more on earthly things as a result of being lukewarm than spiritual matters. 
You know, some other ways to recognize if you're a lukewarm Christian, you allow other things now to come before God. As he was the priority, other things and other people now come before God. And missing some of the services becomes routine. So I was talking to another sister in Christ who close friends with the sister that acknowledged that she was lukewarm. I said, how is she doing? Because I had some concerns for some reasons. And she says, well, I'm concerned about her and she's coming. She's just coming on Wednesdays now. I said, Wednesdays? She's not coming on Sundays? No, she's not coming on Sundays. So I reached out to her and texted her and she responded. I was thankful for that and been able to, to have a study online th with both of these individuals to try to encourage her more. And this is when she acknowledged that she had become, she believed, lukewarm in her, ser in her service. But one indication for her was, well, she's, she's coming less. She's allowing other things to come before God. There's and so that's, that's one indicator in, in her situation, her case at least. And more than likely, if we become lukewarm, we're going to find ourselves compromising more with sinful things. Things before that we wouldn't compromise. We, we're, we're weaker now. And we uh, maybe uh, allow ourselves to watch things we shouldn't be watching, uh, participate in things that we shouldn't be participating in. But we begin to compromise. And if we're lukewarm, we're probably going to associate less with fellow Christians and associate more with those in the world. We're going to lack any really focus or drive to add to our faith. You know, you, you think about that text and hold your place here in Revelation 3. But if you go back just a little bit in your New Testaments to 2 Peter, and just think about what, what our brother Peter says here to the Christians he's writing about growing in their faith. And he, and he begins there in verse 5 of 2 Peter 1 by saying, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Now, let me pause there. Do you picture and envision a lukewarm Christian doing that? I don't. That they're going to give all diligence, all this energy and focus. Well, you know what? I need to grow in these areas, and the Bible says, and the Lord says here, and the Holy Spirit reveals that, and, and so I need to be adding to my faith, and I'm going to give myself diligently. Lukewarm Christian's not going to do that. They have no zeal to do that. They have no spiritual focus to do that. They're not hot or cold. They're lukewarm. So a lukewarm Christian is, not, is going to lack any focus or drive to be adding to their faith. And he goes on to say in verse 8, For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what if these things are not mine and they don't abound? And I'm not giving all diligence to add to it. Then then I am barren, and I, I am, in other words, for barren there, and my Bible is useless. Isn't that kind of what the point Jesus drives home in John 15 as a branch connected to him, the vine? That if we're not bearing fruit, what does he do with those branches? He cuts them off. They're thrown in a pile with other branches, disciples, that's us, who are not bearing fruit. And he prunes us if we are bearing fruit so we'll may, we may bear more fruit so we continue to grow. And he says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, John 15, verse 8. And so, yeah, we're viewed as, as useless if we're not growing, if we're not adding to our faith and we become unfruitful. And verse 9, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even the blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And so the Apostle Peter taught that when a Christian is not growing in the Lord, his or her spiritual vision is affected. Wasn't their spiritual vision affected 
how they viewed themselves and what reality was. And of course, a lukewarm Christian is just going to become less involved in the work of the local church because they're lukewarm. There's no energy there, right? And so I don't know if anyone here this morning is a lukewarm Christian necessarily unless you reveal that, you know, you're, by their fruits you'll, you'll, you'll know them, but sometimes we can, we can put on a, a front or a facade and, and, and not know what's going on, of course, in the heart like the Lord does. I wouldn't have... I wouldn't have said, well, you've become lukewarm, but she was candid enough, the sister in Christ, to say, I've become lukewarm. And so my point is we have to be honest with ourselves and with God in particular, the Lord. Where am I at spiritually? What is my spiritual temperature? Am I hot or cold? Or am I, have I become lukewarm? And, and as I assess myself, there's times where... I would say I've become lukewarm. That I'm not giving all that I could give. I'm not doing all that I should be doing. And, and, and if we recognize that in ourselves, then as Jesus says, we, we need to make correction. We need to repent of that and do better. Because this is how Christ feels about the lukewarm Christian. Right here, pictured. Right? So then because you're, you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, the, the ESV and the New American Standard Bible read pretty much identical here. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. NIV says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You ever drink something and then it was so disgusting you literally did that, spit it out, maybe hopefully the sink if, or if you're outside you're able to do that. It wasn't that long ago in my own house that the water was not tasting good. And I can, I can be a little snooty about water, but <laughs> all the kids were saying the water doesn't taste good. And uh, we, didn't, we, weren't, we didn't know what was going on, called Double Springs, hey, uh, what's going on with the water and, uh, and one time there was something they told us and this time they even had somebody come out and check it and all that and, and I think what it came down to was just the filter needed to be changed before the indicator told us that the filter needed to be changed with the fridge where we get our water at and anyways I mean I was, fill up I drink a lot of water if you know anything about me I'm always drinking water and uh, I got my big Yeti and fill that up and can't even drink this. I got to dump it out and go get some bottled water and just drink that until our water got fixed. But you think about spiritually how serious this is. If we reach a point of being lukewarm, how disgusting that is to Christ. This imagery that he uses here for us that I'm going to vomit you or spew you, spit you out of my mouth. That's how distasteful the lukewarm Christian is to Jesus Christ. So he didn't hold back. Sometimes he didn't, he didn't hold back any punches. He doesn't hold anything back, right? He didn't beat around the bush. He, he came at him strong and hard. Now, when he says this, notice in, in Revelation 3, 17 and 18 again. Right on the hills of saying, you're lukewarm because of that, I'm going to vomit you or spit you out of my mouth. He says, verse 17, because you say, I am rich, have need of nothing. Or excuse me, I'm rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So what do we see here? Well, notice that they had an inaccurate view of their spiritual condition and so an inaccurate view 
of my spiritual condition or, or your spiritual condition is possible, isn't it? It was, it was true for them. And so we can be oblivious to what reality is for me spiritually or you spiritually, and we can have this overconfidence of this is where I'm at. This is how well I'm doing. And Christ sees me way over here, and no, you're not doing well at all. And so it's crucial that we realize and acknowledge when it's the case that we have become spiritually lukewarm. You know, Jesus said in John 15, 5, that's the same text I was just referring to where he said, I'm the true vine, you're the branches, and about bearing fruit and those who don't bear fruit. But he said in John 15, verse 5, without me, you can what? You can do nothing without me. What was their attitude? Some of the Christians at Laodicea. Some or many of them, uh, so we have need of, we have need of nothing, Right? They had become independent, self-satisfied, secure. We have need of nothing. And so a lukewarm Christian is, has become comfortable and complacent and indifferent and, and, and do not always realize their spiritual condition, their weaknesses and their shortcomings before God. But after we... If it is the case and we realize it and we, we acknowledge it like this, sister in Christ, then we, it's, it's, that's a great step to see that in ourselves, I believe, if that's the case. But then what am I going to do about it, right? And that's what I wanted to help her focus on as well since she said that's where I'm at. I said, well, what, what needs to be done? What, what can help change that? And so we have to resolve to make the needed changes in our life. And verse 18, what does Christ do after he says, this is what you say, here's the reality of the situation. You're actually wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and you're blind and you're naked. And he didn't mean that you're literally without clothes. And he didn't mean none of you are, are wealthy because many of them were. He's saying, spiritually speaking, here's your real condition, your true condition. But then in verse 18, what is he saying? But come to me and I can give everything you need to resolve these, these, these issues, these sins, these shortcomings. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed. The shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And so, Revelation 3.19, to the lukewarm Christian, Jesus said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Kind of reminds me of what the Hebrew writer wrote about in Hebrews chapter 12 when he spoke of the chastening of the Lord. You remember he quotes there in verse 5 of Hebrews 12 from Proverbs chapter 3 about, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. This is Hebrews 12 verse 5 again. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor be discouraged when, he, when, when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's exactly what's going on here. Why did Christ come down so hard with, on, on these Christians? Because they needed to, to, a wake-up call. Right? They needed to kind of take, you take someone in and kind of shake them. Wake up! To the, to the reality of, of where you're at spiritually. It is not good whatsoever. You think you're doing great. You're, you're miserable. You're poor. You're wretched. You're blind. You're naked. You're lukewarm and I'm going to vomit you, spew you out of my mouth. But understand, as many as I love, and I love you in Laodicea, I rebuke and I chasten because he wanted them what? To be with him ultimately in heaven for all eternity. And if they continue on this path of lukewarmness, they're not going to be with their Savior, with the Lamb of God. 
They're not going to be able to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb of God. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And as I also overcame and, and sat down with my father on his throne. But right now, those that he's describing here, Laodicea, who are lukewarm, they're not close to overcoming. But if they'll be zealous and repent, they'll be back on the right path again. And so he pleads with them as he does with all these churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Be zealous and repent. You know, Jesus still loves, of course, the lukewarm Christian, even though their love for him has grown cold. And one of the hymns that Todd led us in was the hymn to prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper. But 133 and 506, I had requested that he would lead those in in relation to the lesson this morning, and I appreciate him doing that, but when my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to the Garden of Gethsemane. I can't help but to thank the lukewarm Christian when I think about a child of God whose love for Christ has grown weak. And for deeper faith, I, I seek. I'm at a weak point. But acknowledge that in where I need to go and what I need to remind myself of and focus on. But Christians who are lukewarm must humble themselves and repent. They must stir up that inner fire and cultivate that burn, a burning heart for the Lord. To the lukewarm Christian... Revelation 3 and verse 20, Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now sometimes this passage is used to direct it at the non-Christian, but in context it's at the Christian. Right? I mean, that's the context. It's to the church at Laodicea. You have some enough where this church is described as lukewarm. He didn't say you have an individual there like Jezebel back at the church in Thyatira. You, you there, in a general sense, have become lukewarm. This is directed at them. And here is Christ who loves them. And so he's chasing them. He's rebuked them. He's called on them to repent and be zealous because they lack all zeal when they're lukewarm. And here I am knocking at the door, but I, I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to kick the door in and force my way in. You have to open the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, invites me in, then I'll come to him. I'll dine with him and he with me and we'll have communion. And we'll have fellowship. They had to make changes for that to happen. Also on the hymns that Todd let us in, the first one after the call to worship hymn, 133, which is revive, me, revive Us Again. Again, someone who's got to the point where they're lukewarm, what do they need? They need their faith and their love revived and awakened. Praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the, thine the glory. Revive us again. The last verse says, Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. That's exactly what the Laodiceans needed. That's what we need today if we reach the point of becoming lukewarm for our Lord. And so, I want to return to our scripture reading text as we close the lesson this morning. Titus 2. Because when I think about the message of those two hymns, Revive Us Again and When My Love for Christ Grows Weak, when you look at some of the statements... 
where those hymns are trying to refocus the child of God, the worshiper. It's on the sacrifice of Christ. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great, great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Notice, zealous for good works. Why did Christ give himself for you, for me? Well, to redeem us from every lawless deed, to redeem us from sin, to bring salvation, to save us. But also then to purify for himself his own special people. That's the putting off and the putting on. We're called to holiness. Why did Jesus give himself for us? Here's a, here's a third reason. To be zealous for good works or good deeds. Are you zealous for your Lord. Right now, can you describe your service to God and to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, as I am zealous for Him? I am hot, I am not lukewarm. Or can you identify right now in your spiritual condition there's some lukewarmness there that needs to be addressed, that needs to be repented of? and to be zealous for my Lord and Savior again, and to be reminded why we should be, because of what He's done for us. He loved us so much, gave Himself for us to save us, to redeem us, to purify for Himself His own special people, but who are zealous for good works. And so let us examine ourselves this morning and see what condition we are in. And if we're the lukewarm Christian, that we'll repent. That we'll be zealous, that we'll take the rebuke and the chastening of the Lord, knowing he, he, he loves us and He wants us to be with Him forever. And so those who are children of God and who recognize sin in your life, then this is a good time to make that right with God. Perhaps you seek the prayers and encouragement of your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're happy and willing to give that to you now. If you're not a child of God, we hope that you will repent and be obedient to Him, that you'll believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, and then, yes, zealously serve the Lord. Give Him your all, for surely He has given us His all. Through the Lord's invitation, let that be known as we stand, as we sing.